Hello and welcome back to the channel. You know, it's been almost four years since I reviewed the Edmund Scientific AstroScan telescopes. But in that four years, I haven't really seen a lot of these come my way. But as the law of averages happens, a couple of these have just come my way recently. And I thought it would be time to take another look at the Edmund AstroScan and try to determine if one of these is still worth buying in 2024. Let's take a look. Okay, so the Edmund Astro Scan, if you don't not familiar with it, it actually is a conventional Newtonian telescope. There is a mirror in the back that gathers four and a quarter inches worth of light. The focal length is 445 millimeters. There is a secondary mirror that deflects the light into the eyepiece, and this is where you look, this is how you focus, and to change magnifications, you change eyepieces. Again, fairly conventional, except we have this bowling ball type thing here at the back here. This actually isn't a new idea. Amateur telescopes have been using things like bowling balls as axis mounts for quite some time. There have been a lot of these made. <laughs> Estimates range from anywhere between 80 and 90,000 of these made starting in 1976 and ending somewhere around 2012 or 2013. If those numbers are even close to accurate, that would make this one of the best-selling serious amateur telescopes of all time, and perhaps the best-selling telescope of all time. Now, when I was a kid, I spent countless hours in my bedroom looking at this, the Edmund Scientific Catalog. Mine were of the late 1970s vintage, and I would just dream about owning one of these things. At the time, they were $199, still a lot of money back then. By the time they got to the end of their production run, the price had risen to $329 or perhaps even more. It wasn't competitive with some of the new stuff coming out of China. Now, these have been made in USA. For a short time, they were made in Japan. Now, today, we tend to assume that anything made in Japan is associated with a high-quality product. But back then, it wasn't quite so clear-cut. You'll find fans of the... USA made and the Japan made versions, and I think it's going to depend a lot upon the sample that you got. And that's a big problem with astro scans quality control. This is a divisive telescope among amateur astronomers, and I think again it depends on the one that you had when you first bought one. Some of these are pretty good, some of these probably shouldn't have left the factory in the condition that they were in, and one of the main problems is at f4. It is very unforgiving. Your margin of error is quite small, and there is no way to collimate this thing. Whatever comes out of the factory, that's what you get. You know, when you first get one of these things, your first impression is very often just how much this thing weighs. <laughs> it weighs a lot more than you think it might based upon the way that it looks. And the reason it does weigh a lot is because there are two semicircular weights in the back of the optical tube. Now, I've never liked this solution to balance things out. It just seems like a waste of resources. The optical tube here weighs about 8.6 pounds. And just as a reference, that weighs as much as this 6-inch schmidt cassegrain And this thing's only a 4-inch. But it gets even worse because the base underneath here weighs another 2 pounds. So you've got 10.5 pounds or so worth of weight that you've got to get on a tripod or a mount of some kind. As a result, I'm seeing a lot of these getting undermounted, and I'm also speculating that's why a lot of these get damaged. These things do fall off mounts. So when you're looking at these, one thing you want to watch out for is missing parts. You'll see that one over there is missing the peep sight finder, it's missing the strap, and it's missing the cover. And the problem with missing parts is it's very difficult to get them back by themselves. You get the clear optical window here that holds the secondary mirror. And then again, there are no secondary spider veins to look at. That's the advantage. The disadvantage, of course, is this collects dew and you can't collimate it. The focuser here has come under some fire. It's just a metal tube with a rubber roller here. And the roller can develop flat spots that's annoying. You know, good focusers are expensive. I'm inclined to give that one a pass. The peep sight finder was added later, and as you can see, it's not ideal either. It's held on by only one bolt, and in the dark, 
this can go out of alignment really quickly like this without you realizing it. So we should probably talk about the marketing here. The catalog here is, is really, really good. See, look at it, look what it says. Study nature by day, study the stars at night. AstroScan lets you do both. Wow, I mean, he's got pictures of a guy holding it by the ocean there. You got a guy on the hood of his car. You've got somebody hiking with the thing slung over its back. Oh my goodness, I hope nobody actually tried to do that. And on the next page, they tried to sell you some accessories. Some of this stuff is somewhat useful. Some of it was completely useless. What you really want to avoid is this paying extra for this uh, erect image device here. And the, the copy editor is, is great. It says, it's the same type of prism found in binoculars costing as much as $600. Wow, I want that, right? No, no, you, you don't want that. <laughs> that thing's a piece of junk. It's all, it also acts like a mild Barlow. It's like a 1.3 Barlow. Normally that helps the image. I had one of those in one of these once and it was just horrible. So, you know, marketing, Edmund was really good at this. So, I mean, they, they, they made you look like uh, these are good telescopes and he made you really want them. But, uh, but trust me, all this stuff here that you see in, these, in this catalog, it's junk. There's, there isn't one good telescope in here. So your major challenge in any tabletop telescope is, of course, finding something to set it on. And I've done a couple of solutions here. I haven't really found anything that's ideal. Now keep in mind here, this is light out. You can see all of this, but in the dark, you may not be able to see this very well. And keep in mind, there's nothing attaching the telescope to the mount itself. You could run into this and these things could hit the deck. Now this does have a quarter inch by 20 thread at the bottom of the base. And you could in theory thread a camera tripod plate on it, which I've done here. So don't count on the ability to do this. I was somehow able to get this to work. Now on this one, you have the peep sight. The peep sight I do not consider to be optional. I have never bought into this idea that a low power telescope is its own finder. I've never been able to get that to work. Even with the 28 millimeter eyepiece in here, you're at 16 power. I had trouble finding things. And the worst part about this is you can't even sight along the tube to the object because the ball is in the way. So you gotta have to rig something here. I got really frustrated because of this didn't have it. So you've seen me do this before. This is a, it's the Rigel Quick Finder that I've attached to an elastic band. And this can just go over here and it's crude, but this does work. Unfortunately for this one, this means I actually had to use this telescope. This one is really bad. It's out of collimation, and I suspect even if it were in collimation, it still wouldn't be very sharp. I didn't have a lot of fun looking through this thing, even looking at the moon. There's light spraying everywhere, and it's not sharp. But this one, the optics are actually quite nice. It's in collimation, and the stars are reasonably sharp. Looking at the deep sky objects, I was able to find all of these, and it's a pretty impressive list for such a cheap telescope that's this old. The dimmest thing I was able to find is NGC 2158. That is the tiny cluster inside or next to M35 in Gemini. It didn't look great, but I did actually see it. Really, you know, for most people, they're gonna be looking at the moon, the Orion Nebula, the Pleiades, maybe the Andromeda Galaxy and the double cluster, and that's pretty much it. Now I did find Jupiter and Saturn. Yes, you can see the rings. Yes, you can see the four moons of Jupiter. They're not great, but it's a taste of what's to come if you're interested in planetary observing. I am sometimes asked what I think about these Edmund RKE eyepiece. These are classified in the Kellner family. They originally sold for $29, and I think they are good value for the money. I don't know as if they're much more or much less than that. If you browse internet forums, you'll see people claiming some sort of magical properties on these RKEs. I've never found that to be true. I just found that they're just decent Kellner eyepieces and moderately collectible for those who are interested in our hobby. Did I use other eyepieces in these astro scans? No, I did not. And there's a good reason for this, and it has to do with the focuser. You'll notice there is no set screw or no compression ring holding the eyepiece in place. Rather, there is a leaf spring that's sort of bent inwards and the tension holds the eyepiece in. That leaf spring is sharp and it will scratch your eyepiece barrel when you move it in and out. This accounts for 
many of the RKE eyepieces that you see out there that have damaged barrels. And it gets worse because as time goes on, that spring kind of loses its tension and you'll see a lot of people will get a pair of pliers or something and they'll you know, bend it inwards and that scratches the eyepiece even more. Even worse is the Barlow lens. I don't know if you can see this here, but there's a sharp metal tab in there that holds the eyepiece in. That is so sharp, you can cut your finger on that thing and every time you pull the eyepiece out, it will scratch your eyepiece barrel. Having said that, if you have all the Edmund eyepieces, including the Barlow and the case, you've actually got something that's moderately collectible. And if you are gonna collect these things, I'll tell you right now, the two items that are gonna be hard to find are the Barlow and the case. Okay, so is this telescope still relevant and does it still rate a buy in 2024? You know, for most of the period of this review, I was gonna tell you, no. <laughs> and main, the main reason is, I was playing for some reason mostly with this one. This is not a good astro scan. The images aren't sharp, it's not collimated, it's not fun to use. But then I played with this one, and this one is in collimation, the star test is good, and it is sharp, and just having it around in the garage, I found myself just taking this out and looking through it from time to time, and I kinda like this one. So, just seeing this one made me rethink all of the astro scam and lastro scan clever quips that I've been thinking up to use in this review. So I'm going to say cautiously, yes, you can buy one of these things and enjoy it in 2024. There's a big caveat here. Everybody's buying things online these days. You can't tell which one you're going to get because this one is bad, this one is good. I have seen good samples of these selling for well under $100. Don't pay too much. If you think you were in love with some pictures that you saw online and the seller's asking too much, walk away. Don't worry, another one's gonna come around at some point. So what, you were in love for an afternoon, you'll fall in love again. And I've even seen cases where some of these are given away. Yes, that's right, I have been given Edmund Astro scans. So with those two caveats in mind, I'm gonna say cautiously, yes, take a look at these. These are still relevant in 2024, if for nothing else, for the history that this model represents in our hobby. I hope this has helped you to determine if you want an Edmund Astro Scan and if one of these telescopes is in your future. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.